Welcome to Morningstar Christian Chapel YouTube channel. Please remember to hit that subscribe button, like button, and the notification bell so you can find out when we go live or post a new video. And be sure to leave a comment about what God has shown you in this message. Thanks, and enjoy the study. All right, let's open our Bibles this morning to the Gospel of Luke chapter 17, verse 20. As we continue our studies through Luke's gospel, we are just a few one, months away, maybe a month and a half or so from the cross. The Lord is going through all of the various smaller villages, seeking to reach the inhabitants to preach the good news of his coming, why he came, who he is. The religious leaders now are just crazy. They want him dead. They are plotting his demise as the Lord continues to reach out to the, to the masses to continue to teach the disciples as well about his way. This morning we come to another one of these conversations that Jesus had with his uh, detractors, but also with his own, in, in regards to the question of the kingdom of God. When will it come? In fact, we read in verse 20 here, now it was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come. And Jesus answered, and he said, The kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, See here or see there, but indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. And then he said to his disciples, The days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. Certainly the um, disciples and the Pharisees shared, and the crowd for that matter, shared one opinion and that was their conviction about the coming of the Messiah would be the same. Their anticipation was, was the same. When Jesus gets closer to Jerusalem in Luke 19, you will read that he spoke an additional parable to his disciples because when they got near to Jerusalem, they thought that the kingdom of heaven would now appear suddenly. And so the ex expectation certainly of the, Messiah, of the Messiah's coming for the, the religious leaders, for the disciples, and for the crowd, was that when he came, he would be a political deliverer. He would take Israel out from under the Roman bondage and make Jerusalem the capital of the world, and the Messiah would be just a big delivering man who would give them, like Moses, deliverance from their oppressors. And that was really what they hung on to. The disciples... Uh, one of the last questions they will ask Jesus when he ascends into heaven there in Acts chapter 1 is they will say to him, well, you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel. And, and Jesus says, not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has in his own hands, but you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You're going to be my witnesses, beginning here in Jerusalem, going throughout the world and all. And then he disappeared from their sight. I mean, is, is it now? Is the kingdom going to be now? The disciples had been hearing for the last year, especially with increasing frequency, the fact that Jesus was going to die. Now, that didn't sit well with them and with their understanding of the kingdom. And so they did one of a couple of things. They either ignored it or, or they said to themselves, yeah, he says a lot of stuff we don't understand. Just, it'll be fine. Or they spiritualized it away, as the Jews even do today. Or they just kind of let it go, figuring... <clears throat> well, this, you know, we know what we're talking about. And so it was a hard transition for them to leave the common held belief of the Messiah and what he would do when he came. In reality, if you look at the Gospels, the teaching of Jesus about the kingdom was one of his favorite subjects. It shows up in just these four Gospels, 85 different places where the Lord wants them to think about the gospel. It, it is uh, the, the coming of the Lord. It is at the heart of Jesus' teaching. It is the primary subject of almost all of the parables he tells, the kingdom of God. We know now, as we look at the entire Bible, certainly, that the kingdom of God was first set up in the hearts of men, that those who believed in him would have the Holy Spirit come to dwell within them. Jesus will say to the disciples, he's been with you, but he shall be in you. The Bible describes this new birth that you've experienced, hopefully in your own heart, as the mystery of the Gospels. It is the mystery of this church age, if you will, and that this hidden kingdom will really remain hidden from view, except in the lives of the people, until the Lord returns to rule and reign upon the earth. And then when he returns, 
that coming again will be powerful and public and will certainly bring the judgment of God. But it will also fulfill all of the promises that God has made to the nation of Israel in terms of ruling and reigning through them and using them and all. And so <clears throat> when Jesus came the first time, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven there in interchangeable terms took place. Jesus came to take the sins of the world upon his own shoulders. He promised to pour the Holy Spirit into the hearts of those who believed in him. And this mystery of the church age, this, this, this time when, you know, those who early on looked at the Old Testament might have not, but put them together. There's a coming of the Messiah, and then he's going to rule and reign. But, but they don't see this church age of grace that we now find ourselves in, where the new birth takes place and the Holy Spirit comes in dwells in you, God's kingdom in, in your hearts this morning. If you believe in Christ, you are in God's kingdom. You are born again, Christ in you, the hope of glory. When John the Baptist early on in Matthew came upon the scene, he had one message. He, had a one, he was a one-message preacher. And he would say this, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When Jesus later found John arrested and, and really promoted the Lord's public ministry, if you will, cha Matthew chapter 4, Jesus, it says, began to preach at that time, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So he took up the message that John began to declare. And when John was put into prison, Matthew writes that Jesus came into the, the, the north there preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, saying the time is fulfilled the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now you repent and you believe in the gospel. And so <laughs> the kingdom is a, an important subject, not only today for us, but certainly it was for those in that day. In fact, Matthew uses the, the phrase kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom a lot. Over and over again, you will, you, you will find. So the Jewish anticipation of the Messiah when he came was largely based on a number of Old Testament passages which described the earthly rule of the Messiah, or we would say his second coming, because first he would come to die, to, to redeem, to send his spirit within our hearts. But we know that now. It wasn't nearly so clear then, if you will. And so they read the scriptures, and they began to just look at his rule, and he's going to reign upon the earth. We read Isaiah 5, uh, 35 this morning as well. So uh, passages like I Isaiah chapter 9, where, where it talks about, you know, a, son, a child being born, a son being given, the government was upon his shoulders, his name would be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of his, the increase of his government and his kingdom, there would be no end, he'll rule forevermore, and that's what the Messiah is going to do, he's going to come and take over. And we're going to rule with him, and, and we're going to be under his care, and the Jews are going to be exalted, if you will, uh, from all of the pressure that we've been under. <clears throat> Daniel, <clears throat> excuse me, in chapter 2, writes about in those days of those kings that the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, a kingdom that will uh, not be left to other people, but it will break in pieces, consume every other kingdom, and that kingdom of God will stand forever. And again, those who are reading the Old Testament with great hope hung on to those promises. Entire chapters like Isaiah chapter 11 or chapter 12 write of the, the hope and the expectation and the looking forward to a coming Messiah, a deliverer. We read, like I said this morning, um, in Isaiah chapter 35 as well about the glory that the earth would see, that the animal kingdom and, and the agriculture and and there would be peace upon the earth, and the Lord would reign. This beautiful, glorious future. And that's what they were expecting to take place immediately. Isaiah would write in chapter 2 that in those days, in those last days, the mountain of the Lord would be established in the tops of the mountains, and it is the house of Jacob. God will teach us his ways. We will walk in his paths, out of Zion, the law will flow, and the word of the Lord will reach from Jerusalem to all of the world. Well, that's what they were holding on to. And everyone in this crowd, for that most part this morning, what we read, was holding on to that same evaluation and hope. 
If you tell someone today that the Lord is coming and when he comes there's going to be peace and rest, but there's firstly going to be judgment, you will be probably labeled a doom and gloom kind of person. But you can imagine how this went over in these days. But how can it be doom and gloom? No war, no suffering, kindness, righteousness, justice. <clears throat> Jesus had spoken often to his disciples about the kingdom. It had started a year earlier. But he always added this, I have to suffer first and die. And then one day I will return and receive you to myself, and that where I am you must be also, and I will rule and reign, and you'll rule and reign with me upon the earth. All those things were being told to them this last year, if you will, as they headed for Jerusalem. Nevertheless, to say it was a difficult concept to them is an understatement because they had it all wrong, if you will, but they believed they had it all right. To make matters worse, um, the time had come where there was a great expectation that this was the time that the Messiah should be coming. E even from Acts chapter 1, we, we realize that it took a while for it to sink in. This was an easy area of difficulty, but it was also one that the Pharisees used to confront the disciples at a place of... Uh, confrontation. And so when you read in verse 20 here that the Pharisees came to ask him about it, you can be sure they didn't want answers. They wanted debate. They wanted conflict. They wanted difficulty. So here we find these religious enemies of Jesus coming again, like I said, not to, to learn, but to stir up strife. And Jesus gives them a very direct kind of blunt answer. It doesn't give them much explanation I think he knew it was in their hearts. But he did want his disciples to have the proper outlook. And so when you get to verse um, 22, he turns to speak to the disciples. He kind of brushed off these, these you know, religious folks who, who really didn't want to know in terms of those who loved him and, and wanted to believe and were believing in him. And so he begins to explain to them a bit of what they can look forward to. He begins there by saying in verse um, 20, the kingdom of God does not come with uh, observation. Or if you will, there will be no outward visible show in terms of the first coming of the Lord. Why? Because he's coming to move into the hearts of those who believe by faith. The anticipation of the, dis of the disciples and to the these religious enemies to whom Jesus speaks, was that there was going to be no big movement that would be measurable or recognizable to say, well, that must be the Messiah. He's moved in, you know, to the, to the, to the rulership house there in Jerusalem. The, the prophets did speak about an outward, visible kingdom, but that would be way down the road. There were two kingdoms. I think when we started the book of Genesis a while back on Wednesday, I said, the Bible is only concerned with two things. And those two things are the first and the second coming of Jesus. That's really all that God is interested that we learn. Jesus had first come to establish his kingdom in the hearts of men. But when he spoke to Nicodemus, he said, Nicodemus, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Two verses later, he said, unless you're born again, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. So there wouldn't be this big splash, if you will, like everyone there was expecting, if you will. The earthly kingdom of Jesus will come later with his return. But for now, it will not be something that you can observe, if you will, or, or quantify. In, in fact, the, the true church is his kingdom, is his tabernacle, is his home, is his dwelling place. We talk about coming to church. Well, this is a church building where the church meet. But when you leave, it's just a building. When you're here, it's God's people. It's God's church. And that's the way, certainly, that he views us and, and views you and I. And Jesus said the kingdom of heaven would be within you. It, it literally um, set up within you. John chapter 14, the spirit who the world cannot receive, it doesn't see him, it doesn't know him, you know him. He's dwelling with you, he shall be in you. And so the Lord turns to, first of all, says to these, these troublemakers, look, it's not going to be an observable action, if you will. In fact, verse 21, 
if, if people begin to say, he's over here, he's over there, <laughs> don't believe it, don't follow it. That's not the case. The kingdom of heaven is, is first and foremost set up within you. The, the words kingdom of God or, or kingdom of heaven in the Bible are used to designate where God is Lord, where he is accepted by those who look to him as the king, to those who are bound by his rule, who are relying upon his strength, who are looking to follow his ways, where he's the king, he's the Lord. That's his kingdom, and the church is found there. The kingdom is, is today the, in the hearts of true born-again believers, but one day he will be visibly returning to the earth. You might remember that, that conversation Jesus had, very short conversation with Pilate. There in John chapter 18, where Jesus said, or is that, no, Matthew, is it John? No, it's John 18, I guess. Uh, Jesus said to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight and I would not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. And Pilate said, well, are you a king then? And Jesus said, you've said it. I am a king. For this end I was born, for this cause I've come, I could bear witness to the truth. And if, if you hear the truth, you hear my voice. But he, re he mentions or, or references this kingdom rule, that his kingdom is not of this world. No, it's, it's in your heart. And one day he's going to come to gather his people together. If this morning you have received Jesus into your heart and have been born again, you should already be experiencing some of the benefits and the glories of being in his kingdom. You should have peace and joy and rest and hope, rely on his provision, and with anticipation look forward to his return one day to gather you to himself, because that's what he left promising he would come and gather us to themselves, to himself. So to these hateful unbelievers, these scribes and Pharisees who are having regular meetings to see if they can kill Jesus and not rile the crowds too much, Jesus gives a very terse answer regarding his work saving really the explanation more fully to his own, to those who love him and believe him and trust in him. And so in so doing, he now turns from the, the, the now and the soon kingdom within you to the future kingdom. But he begins with when the church age ends, which ends at the rapture. God will work in the hearts of men until that day when he comes to gather the church, the rapture of the church, and then that church age is finished and that seven-year period of God's dealing with Israel as a nation begins again. And so all of those promises that the Jews in the crowds were hanging on to would then that day be fulfilled. But there's a timeline that needs to be followed, and it is referenced, referenced if you will, throughout the Scriptures. And so that, the, the rapture, seven-year great tribulation, and then the Lord's return with his, with his people to rule and reign upon the earth. So Jesus, in verse 22, turns to his disciples and tells them that there's a coming time when they do, would desire to see the days of the Son of Man, but they're not going to see it. And they will say to you, well, look over here or look over there, but don't go after them. Don't follow them, for as lightning that flashes out of one part under heaven shines to the other part under heaven, so also shall be the Son of Man in his day. So now Jesus turns, like I said, directly to his own, really leaves these chiders aside, and he addresses this important subject. And he begins by saying this, you see me now, but soon you won't see me, though you'll long to see the day when I was here with you. You'll desire for my return. You'll anticipate it. During that time of waiting, there'll be lots of uh, men or women or whoever they might be claiming to be the Messiah. Come out here and, and, and see him. Come over there and you'll find him. And Jesus said, don't join any of those false Messiah groups. Don't join in. Don't follow their ideas. Because when I come, it's not going to be in secret. It won't be just seen by some. It won't take place in some hidden corner somewhere. Instead, I'm coming to rain. And my return will be like lightning that flashes on one side of the, of the sky and it continues to the other. No one will be hidden from it. Jesus had just said the kingdom of God now would be without observation. But he says to the disciples, when I return, everyone's going to see it. And everyone's going to understand that this is the Lord's coming. There'll be no doubt. 
you might want to share that with your Jehovah Witness friends who claim that Jesus came invisibly. And I don't know how they saw him if he was invisible. They, first they said he came in 1874, then to a, an apartment in New York, I think, 1914. You can understand the confusion. Well, just read your Bible. You'll be just fine. When he comes, everyone will see him. You say he snuck in and snuck out, I say no way. He'd have told me if he was going to sneak in and sneak out. He told me otherwise. So the world today offers lots of false hopes, and there are false messiahs that continue to come with their hoaxes and their lies. And look, there will be no new age until Jesus comes. And then it will indeed be his kingdom upon the earth, and then you can find peace. We... we we read in Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, Behold, he will come with the clouds, and every eye will see him. And they will look upon him whom they pierced, and the kindreds of the earth will wail because of him. When the Lord comes, they'll know. They'll know. And we'll be ready. Matthew writes in chapter 24, After the tribulation of those days, again, chronologically, the sun will be dark and the moon will not give their light. The stars will fall from heaven. The powers of heaven will be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all of the tribes of the earth mourn when they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. I know Greg likes to read this Greg glory, but that's not at all what it says. <laughs> great, great glory. Every eye will see him. But right now, he's get visible only in the hearts of his people. He's, his kingdom consists of hearts turned to him. To us, he is recognizable. The key is in verse 25. But first, he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. It's all about timing. For the anticipation of the Jews and the disciples, even the, the religious the scribes and Pharisees, they wanted this glorious kingdom to come. They were hanging on to these wonderful promises of his rule down the road to, to rule the world from Jerusalem and all, that his word would be the governing force. But they set aside many prophecies in the Old Testament which declared that he was going to suffer, that he was going to die, that he was going to be rejected by men. If you go to Israel today and speak to folks who are reading the Old Testament, you will find that nearly every one of those prophecies about the suffering Messiah has been spiritualized. And so they will say to you in Isaiah 53, this is an allegory of Israel's suffering in the world when it clearly speaks of an individual. They will tell you it's the nation's war. It's allegorical. that They just won't receive it literally as fact. If you read Isaiah 53, very detailed um, presentation, if you will, of the of the, the Messiah's suffering and his first coming. Read Isaiah chapter 20, or sorry, uh, Psalm 22 of, of the Lord's crying out, why, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it, it gives detailed evidences a thousand years B.C. Of, of the cross and of the suffering and all, and the suffering of the Messiah and his death. Go to Daniel chapter 9, and it speaks of a, a prophecy about the coming of the Messiah who will be cut off, but not for himself. He will give his life for others. And you set them all next to each other. And you, you can't really walk away but without saying, well, there's going to be something else taking place. It is a good argument to never spiritualize a text unless the text itself calls for it. We pointed it out quite a bit when we were going through the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation has a lot of allegories, a lot of similes. But every one of that's used in the book of Revelation is defined somewhere else in the Bible. So that you can use the Bible to interpret the Bible, if you will, yourself. The point, verse 25, is that before this glory of the Lord's coming to rule and reign, there will be a time of, for him, suffering, humiliation, rejection, and death, followed by a time where in this church age, now men are given and women are given a choice whether we're going to believe in him or not. The wages of sin is death. God's gift to those who believe in him will be eternal life. This church age of grace was not anticipated by the disciples or the religious leaders, and the time between the kingdoms, the kingdom within and the one, one day without, 
was not clearly seen. So before this rulership that you're hoping for, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to die. There's going to be suffering involved. Then he moves forward to the time of the, of the end of the church age, which is what they're looking for. When will the Lord be coming to rule? And he says in verse 26, As it was in the days of Noah, so also shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. They ate and drank, married wives. They were given in marriage until the time that Noah was entered the ark and the flood came to scourge them all. Likewise, as it was in the days of Lot, they ate and drank and bought and sold, planted and built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. So will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. So here's the process, right? Here's the outline. When will the Lord's kingdom be seen? Well, for now, he's going to be in the heart, not seen without observation. But... There's coming a time when the Lord will end the church age, if you will, this age of grace, and God will again turn to Israel to not only fulfill his promises, but do everything that the Old Testament promises to have happen in regards to his rule and reign. There'll be the church age, the rapture, seven years of great judgment and tribulation, the Lord's return with his people, and then this thousand-year reign before a new heaven and a new earth. So, Leading up to the great tribulation and then his glorious appearance with his saints and rulership is the rapture. What is the characteristic of the rapture? It is the only thing in the Bible that has no specific date attached to it. In other words, I can't tell you when the rapture is going to take place. But the minute the rapture takes place, I can tell you the day Jesus is returning. I can tell you the day that the Antichrist in the middle of that seven-year period is going to set himself up as God. Because the Bible dates them. The only <laughs> undated, if you will, I don't know, is that a word? I, it's, we're going to use that one. Undated <laughs> is, is this waiting by the church for the coming of the Lord to end the church age, to gather his kingdom to himself before that the, the rest kind of progresses. Note that in verse 27 and, and six, 26 and 27, that the first, uh, that first it's the days of Noah are described as being similar to the day in which the Lord will come for his own, which will then lead to his second coming down the road. And so you read the words, as it was, so shall it be. It's a, it's a formula of comparison and, and application. In both cases, the, the return of the Messiah in the days of Noah and Lot found the world wholly unexpected him to be here. They were unexpected. He was unexpected. Noah and his family were the exception, I guess. In the days of Noah, eating, drinking, marrying, planning for marriage, life as usual, the idea was they were obliv oblivious to the days in which they lived. They just weren't in tune. They were living under the shadow of God's impending judgment, which will come after the rapture of the church as well, and yet they, they weren't aware of it. It just seemed like life was fine, and nothing would ever change. This is the way life goes. Jesus had said in the Sermon on the Mount that the world was consumed with the temporal, eating and drinking and clothing, and what to wear and what to, what to, you know, where, where, where to live. And, and he said, you seek first the kingdom of God, and, and God will take care of all of those other things. In other words, you keep your eyes on Jesus, and Jesus will keep his eyes on you. Be spiritually focused. For 120 years, Noah built an ark. Every day, he must have been in the news, I would think. But no one reacted. No one repented. No one planned to meet God's wrath. Peter, when he wrote his letters there in 1 Peter and in 2 Peter as well, actually I think 2 Peter, probably these verses, but, but Peter wrote, uh, know this first, that there will come in the end of days scoffers walking after their own lust will they say, hey, where's the coming of his, where, where's the promise of a coming? We've been hearing that since our dads were young. And Peter said they are willfully ignorant of the fact that God from heaven in old had the earth stand out of the water and, and the world when, which was then overflowed by the water. They didn't listen. They are just ignorant of the fact God has stepped into you know, human existence, if you will, with judgment before. And they just aren't willing to pay attention. 
But the, the judgment of God that is coming will, will come with, with no expectation. The, the church hopefully is looking up and wa wanting to, to be gathered together. We, we know the days in which we live. And yet, for the world, there's no benefit of a, of a biblical record or a testimony. They just choose to ignore it. The days of Noah, if you go back and read in the book of, of Genesis chapter 6, were days of the flesh. People were run by their daily, uh, by their body appetites. They categorized by or characterized by ungodliness and, and demons and, and existential philosophies, corrupt and violent. Sounds a lot like our days, doesn't it? Come Lord Jesus. So the Lord makes the point to his disciples that the coming of the Lord will catch the world by surprise. And it is specifically the rapture that is in view here, which will start the final process of his return. Verse 28 and verse 29 as it was in the days of Lot. <laughs> days of Lot, run-of-the-mill days when everything seemed to be fine. But one of those days into the, into the routine, judgment fell and people died. Many were judged. In fact, the day that Lot and his family were let out by the angel of the Lord, destruction came unexpectedly. We do know what the days of Lot were like in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. It was a day of perversion, uh, Genesis 19, people lived without shame, tremendous homosexuality. Jerusalem uh, found itself, according to Isaiah, in much the same place in the days of Isaiah. He said, you're just like Sodom. The prophet Ezekiel in chapter 16 goes out of his way to describe the life in Sodom before its destruction. He said they were filled with pride, overcome with indulgence. Uh, there was an abundance of idleness, and no one cared about the poor. So again, verse 30, the surprise element was, and the ingredient was that the Lord would enter in, take out the church, and, and the judgment of God would, would fall, and, and people wouldn't be ready. It's interesting that both Noah and Lot are used as examples. Noah is a type of Israel who God will use to illustrate, if you will, that he will protect his own people during the time of the tribulation. He'll take them to Petra. You might have read those verses, uh, when God's judgment is poured out upon the earth. Lot is a type of the church who was, who was delivered from the judgment to come. And so neither were without sin. Both were looking to the Lord uh, in the midst of a perverse kind of situation. They both exemplified the last days in which Jesus would, would return for the church and then eventually return to rule and to reign. The cultures of both of their lives were extremely sinful absolutely indifferent to the faith, spiritually dead to even the thought of his coming. Then we read in verse 31, In that day, he who is on the house stop and his goods are in the house, let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. I don't think that's most people's memory verse. Remember Lot's wife. In that day, in that day refers to the seven-year tribulation period, which will start the minute the church is removed. Because remember, these are the Jews saying, when will he come? And so the rapture begins that work, but the culmination in the Lord's return with the saints will be after seven years. According to Matthew 24, Daniel chapter 9, Revelation chapter 12, we know that the abomination of desolation will happen three and a half years into that last seven-year period. It'll be the first three and a half years of the tribulation. There's a lot of progress and profit, it seems. The Antichrist will offer a lot of solutions. But at the three and a half year mark at a finished temple in Jerusalem, he's going to show up and say, okay, starting today, I want to be worshipped as God. You will take my mark or you will die. You won't be able to eat. And that that desecration will happen in the, in the temple, if you will, that was built. And he will demand, like I said, worship of God. And then his vengeance will turn upon the Jews. And God's vengeance will be poured out upon the world. And God will take these Jews, now the mark of his anger, uh, of the Antichrist's anger. And according to Revelation 12, he will protect their flight and keep them for the next three and a half years in the wilderness. Now here the Lord says to the Jews, when you see this taking place, get out fast. Don't go down and get your stuff. Don't bother to hang around. No time to waste. Don't look back. Get out of Dodge. Remember Lot's wife. She thought she couldn't live without her old life. She, it was her demise. She, she couldn't leave it behind. 
the Lord says, leave it behind. In fact, in verse 33, if you seek to save your life, you're going to lose it. But if you'll lose your life, you'll preserve it. So, you know, put your confidence in the Lord. It, it, it really, it, to really find life is like Noah and Lot and those disciples who are taken out and the Jews who, who will be watched over by the Lord when he comes. It's that matter of faith and confidence in him. Well, turning back just to that rapture to the end thing, now the Lord says in verse 34, I tell you, in the night there'll be two men in one bed, one will be taken, the other left, two women grinding together, one taken, the other left, two men in the field, one taken, the other left, and they will say, where, Lord? And he said, wherever the body is there, the eagles will be gathered together. So back to the idea of the rapture and this final work of God beginning, Jesus speaks again and ends this portion with the unexpected nature of and finality of his coming for the church. Notice that when the Lord returns, some will work, we work sleeping, some will be working, and some places it'll be night, other places will be day, just to show you that the Lord thought that the earth was round, just pointing it out. <laughs> uh, in a moment, the separation of good and evil, the believer from the unbeliever, to the believer life eternally caught up in the air with him, to the others left behind to face judgment. What kind of judgment? Revelation 6 through 19, you can read it for yourself. So the disciples say, where, Lord? Where will they be left? And Jesus said, wherever the uh, eagles are gathered together, the word is for, it was the word for vultures. Wherever the dead are gathered, the, the vultures gather. There's a scripture there in John chapter, or sorry, Revelation chapter 19, where at the end of that judgment period, before the Lord's return with his people, he says, come and gather yourself together to the, to the suffer of the great God, the, the flesh of the kings and captains and mighty men and horses and the flesh of all men bound or free. Now the, the vultures are feeding upon them. In other words, that judgment of God will come in that day if you're not ready. So today the kingdom of God is within you. If you believe in him, you have a glorious future. Not only will you be ruled by the Lord now, but when the Lord comes, you'll be gathered together before his judgment falls. And then seven years later, you'll return with him to rule and to reign. You can be ready. But understand that the disciples were just first coming, second coming. When are we coming? <laughs> they would learn as they went. In fact, Paul, by the time he gets to writing the Thessalonians, has it all figured out. God has made it very clear to him. It just took him a little while. I hope you're ready. You should every day look up. Just look up. The Lord might be coming today. I hope I don't see you next Sunday. I hope the Lord comes. How about that? <laughs> Father, thank you this morning for your word to us. How excited we are that, that, Lord, so clearly you've laid out for us the path upon which you want us to walk, the way that, that we can look forward to what you're going to be doing, the, the, the assuredness of your word, and to the disciples, a great peace and a warning to those who wouldn't believe in him that in that day when that abomination comes, that they got to get out of Dodge. they got to run to that place that you've called them and look to you to be delivered from this Antichrist, this false Christ, the ultimate one to come. Thank you, Lord, that our word, world is such that with all the upheaval we see, you told us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem in no time like lately have we been doing more and more of that. Because we realize Jerusalem will have peace when Jesus rules from Jerusalem. And so, Father, that you might make us ready. Keep us, keep us in tune with that promise of your coming. The, the, the one that's not on the calendar, that we just don't know the time or the place, but we know the season. And we believe with all of our hearts that we are living in the last days and closer and closer, one day closer to your coming and the trumpet sounding and your, your, your spirit gathering us in the twinkling of an eye. I hope you're ready to hear the Lord's call. If not, the first step is always the same. You go to Jesus, confess your sins, see that he came to die in your place as God in the flesh. Without sin, he took your sin. Without fault, he took your fault. Without blemish, he took our blemishes. He paid for our lives. And now he wants us to trust him. And he wants us to sing his name in a song that glorifies him. For he's the Savior. He's the Lord. He's the one who's returning soon. 
to rule and to reign. Give Jesus your life. Come and pray with the pastors after the service. You that are online, follow the links in the description box and follow those to our page that will talk to you about what it means to receive the Lord. <clears throat> Do that today. Who knows? He may be back before the afternoon is over. Shall we stand? <clears throat>